Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Air Distribution System Design. I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Dan Inhout, our Chief Engineer. Dan, take it away. Thank you. Okay, everybody. My name is Dan Inhout. Some of you know me. Uh, hopefully, some of you know me anyway. Uh, I'm Chief Engineer here at Kruger. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I'm a distinguished lecturer from ASHRAE. I was on the board for a little while, and I've written a whole bunch of technical papers. So some people think I know what I'm talking about. Um, one of my jobs is to manage presentation of product data. And in, in doing that, we've been producing ADPI charts in our catalogs. I've just looked it up for 15 years, uh, which no one else has done. So uh, either we're out in front or we're all alone. I don't know which. In any case, we've been doing this. And uh, one of the things I do is provide advanced application engineering information when people call up with weird questions, which happens. So. What are we going to do today? Well, we're looking about air distribution design and product selection. So what is our goal? Well, our goal, obviously, is to create comfort. Um, I do have to remind people on occasion that our goal is not to save energy. If you want to save energy, shut the system off and send everyone home. You'll save energy. Uh, our goal is to do keep people comfortable at as lowest energy cost as possible. So we're going to talk about the things we have to do. We have four things we're going to discuss today. Tools, loads, diffuser, and terminal selection. We're going to start talking about tools, and we have a number of tools that are available from Kruger. Um, these include uh, the quick release, uh, quick reference product catalog that we just released a couple months ago. And we spent a lot of time working on this and we're doing some unique things and we'll talk about the things we're doing in this quick reference catalog that no one else has done and certainly we haven't done before. Um, Kruger website is probably as robust a website as available in the air distribution industry. We've got a lot of stuff on there including uh, all the catalog information you'd want, a number of videos, uh, some software uh, selection programs including the case select selection pro program which uh, is downloadable and will run from there. Some stuff runs on the website as if it were a computer program. In fact, there are some spreadsheets that are that are secretly linked uh, in the website for products that have multiple sizes, like the uh, the SH and some grills. You can get a number of different sizes and get catalog data. So, in doing diffuser selection, we kind of need to start with. Uh, how do we describe how air moves in a large space? And I, we spent a lot of time talking about the open plan office, and we're going to talk about open and closed and perimeter and interior, et cetera, et cetera. But ADPI was developed before I started in this industry, back in the 60s. The Air Diffusion Performance Index is a measure of uh, how jets collide in an open plan office with multiple diffusers. It's based on the ratio of the 50 foot a minute throw to the distance halfway between the diffusers. And in this example, at this point, the jets would collide and fall into the space, and the goal is, obviously, to control that in some manner. Uh, in simple terms, the higher the ADPI, the higher percentage of points that meet this performance index, the more well-mixed a space is and the more uniform the space should be. Assuming the thermostat is set at the right space, this then translates to some kind of comfort thing. So we want to figure out how to put diffusers in an open plan office. And in doing this catalog preparation, I stumbled upon an interesting equation for any four-way air outlet in an open plan office. It's a simple calculation for calculating the diffuser spacing. It's simply uh, the design airflow per diffuser um, divided by the airflow per unit area at design and take the square root of that value and that is the separation distance. You say, what? How can it be that simple? Well, we take a 1400 diffuser with an eight inch neck and an NC of 30, which is 380 CFM. Divide that by 0.6, you get 600 something. Take the square root of that, you get 25. That's how far apart the diffuser should be to get 0.6 CFM a square foot. Pretty simple, huh? Um, I figured that out about halfway through creating the catalog. If you do the math, you may find sometimes you get 24, sometimes you get 26 uh, instead of 25. It's close enough. Um, if we know the diffuser spacing, now we can do the more important thing. We can figure out how far can I turn down this air distribution system before it becomes uncomfortable. Well, 
For that, we can use the uh, Kruger case like program, which has been around uh, since the mid 90s. Uh, this computer program, uh, you can uh, input variables, you can do the ADPI calculation. It's been done in this particular calculation with a L or a characteristic length. Um, in this case, uh, was input at a, at a value that resulted in, in uh, uh, this, what you see. So 380 CFM, 25 foot spacing, L is 12, gives us an ADPI of 85%. And when you complete this process in the program, it changes this column, which used to be neck velocity, now becomes ADPI, and you can see that as I turn this diffuser down, the ADPI goes up, and in fact, you get all the way down to, to 100 CFM, which is well below, you know, like 20%. We still got an ADPI of 86. Uh, some diffusers work really well when you turn them down, uh, and you can use the computer program to figure that out. Um, ASHRAE recommends an ADPI greater than 80% to uh, get the most people satisfied. There's a bell-shaped curve of human response to make it work out. Um, notice that the ADPI goes up as the airflow goes down. Uh, and this happens with most diffusers, but not all. So what is the consequence of having uh, poor ADPI? Well, there's two things that can happen. One, the jets can collide, or two, the airflow cannot make it very far, and being cold, it falls into the space, resulting in uh, what we like to call excessive drop uh, unless, of course, it's a competitor's diffuser, and then the sucker is dumping. Um, ADPI can determine the lowest airflow rate that we can get away with at a given separation distance. So we go through the process of figuring out how far apart the diffusers should be, and now we know the separation distance, we can figure out what the low end is on airflow to get an ADPI of 80%. Why do we care about 80%? Well, if you're doing a LEED certification, and you want to prove compliance to standard 55, the GBCI guys who review the LEED certifications have been pushing back and saying, how are you going to prove that you have less than 5.4 degrees vertical temperature stratification at design load? And the only way we know to do that is to use ADPI. And it was recently approved in a, uh, uh, the user's manual that you could get the uh, vertical temperature stratification proof by getting an ADPI greater than 80%. That's now in the user's manual for standard 55. So we use the separation distance at full flow, and then we figure out what's gonna happen at the, at the low end and how low we can go. If an ADPI is below 80%, the result is that it's likely gonna be uncomfortable at enough spots in the space um, that you're gonna get complaints uh, coming back. The computer program is one way to do it. We figured out somewhere a few years back that there's a better way to display graphically the effective operating range of a diffuser. In this example, I've chosen to use the cheese grater perf, uh, which is the 6200, 6400 Kruger. Uh, every other manufacturer in the industry sells one of these. At one time, this was the highest volume selling diffuser in North America, the perf red face with the uh, pin, pinned uh, cheese graters on the back. Um, this diffuser, uh, in this example, I created a graph with CFM per square foot on the bottom, half diffuser separation up the vertical axis, which is that variable we talked about for ADPI. And the graphs that are, uh, for example, the yellow diamonds, those are simply mathematical plots using the same equation we talked about earlier for diffuser separation um, at 420 CFM a square foot. It's 420 CFM, one CFM a square foot. You can see this dot is right there is about 10 foot halfway to the next diffuser, which is 20 by 20, which is roughly 400 square feet. So you can see that dot simply represents that point. But then we get up here to, at some point, the separation distance falls outside of the 80% ADPI from the computer program, but we've graphed it and we've got a boundary. And this whole left edge of this graph boundary, everything to the left of this line is gonna be ADPI less than 80%. And everything to the right of this line, uh, uh, to the uh, the right side, is less than 80%. So you want to stay in the middle. So as an example, let's start at one CFM a square foot, come up to 420 CFM, which is about an NC35, and it says the diffuser should be 10 foot from the wall, and the lowest airflow I can run through that diffuser at that spacing is somewhere around 0.7 CFM a square foot. Um, uh, obviously, operation below a half a CFM is probably not a good idea. 
but this diffuser works really good at high loads. Um, you can see out here at two, two and a half, three CFM a square foot, we have solutions. But turning this diffuser down doesn't work very well. We've done this for other diffusers. In this example, the prism, and you can see here that uh, in, th in this example, I do the same, the same analysis, but I can turn this diffuser down to 0.4. I do this for, we've done this in our catalog for every ceiling diffuser we make, and we've been doing it for 15 years. These graphs really make it easy to figure out what the turndown is for a diffuser if you know what the separation distance is. So this is a, a useful tool, and engineers have been using it for some time. And the good news is the uh, GBCI, the people at the Green Building Institute, um, have accepted these graphs with these lines drawn on them as proof of compliance to standard 55. So, and finally, why do we want to turn them down? Well, because the lower air movement in the space, the less energy you have to involve in moving that air about the space. There is a myth that people want to feel air motion. That's not true. If it's cold enough, they don't want to feel any air motion. So the secret is to find a temperature at which you can run the airflow as low as possible. And I'll give you a clue that's probably around 73 degrees. And we'll talk about what that low value is as well. So we got this new catalog. What, what's, what's, the, what's the big deal? Well, we went through the, all of our catalogs. And if you know, the full Kruger catalog is a three volume set that weighs about 15 pounds. And we said, there's a lot of stuff in here that no one ever looks at. So the product managers went through and figured out what are the products that people actually buy and what are the sizes of those products and the features of those products that people actually use. And we put those in a quick reference catalog, which as you'll see here on the left side, um, every catalog product in here is two pages. On the left side is the device descriptions. And on the right side is a diagram and a catalog performance page. And we've summarized the performance greatly over what's in the catalog. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, we've taken those ADPI charts and converted them to answers that, well, what we actually use. We've selected an open plan office, which is still 90% of what we do, open plan office, on around a nine foot suspended ceiling, which is part of this description. We picked 0.6 CFM a square foot. We're gonna talk about why we picked that number but that's probably what a good design load number would be in today's environment. And we picked NC30 for another reason. NC, uh, we all know that, that the NC that we report for diffusers in our catalogs assumes a relatively long straight diameter, straight length of straight duct feeding the diffuser. But in reality, there's actually a hard 90 on the ceiling and the room doesn't absorb like we think it probably does. So we've always recommended people to add five to everybody's catalog. So if you want an NC35, you got to pick it at an NC30. So that's what we've done. And we went through and for the typical sizes that people buy, in this case of a PLQ, 12 by 12 and 24 by 24, these are the typical sizes. We picked the NC at 30 NC, pick what is the airflow at NC30. That gives us a value for, uh, for an NC entering argument. And then we take that value, divide it by 0.6, take the square root of that, that gives us our spacing. And then we go to those charts that are in the catalog and see what the minimum CFM per square foot is, um, or we can use case like, but we've done that work for you. So in this catalog presentation, we're now saying, here's what the NC you want to use as a design for the typical NC people have. Um, tells you what the diffuser spacing should be and what the turndown should be for that diffuser. And Works out really well for the prism. We tried it for the uh, uh, a different diffuser and other things happened. Here's a blow up, you can see it a little better than in another diagram, but um, you can see we've got design spacing at 0.6 CFM per square foot and the minimum CFM per square foot for the PLQ. PS, the printed catalog had an error on this first one. We fixed it here. Not all diffusers, however, work at these turn down. If you look at the molded fiberglass back pan diff perforated diffuser, the 6300, um, you can see that uh, the NC is about the same, uh, but and the spacing is about the same, but it says NA. And the reason it says NA is because this diffuser has no turn down. In fact, it isn't even 80% ADPI at 0.6 CFM a square foot. It's uh, something less than that, uh, probably, I don't know, 75, something like that. Um, but we say NA 
Uh, there's two or three diffusers that fall into this category that actually don't work at 0.6 CFM a square foot. Um, so just because we show the value, that is the spacing, doesn't tell you that it's acceptable. So you can look at this NA, you can see you can't turn it down. So in addition to trying to comply with comfort requirements and lead, there are some standards that we have to deal with. Um, ASHRAE standards 62 and 90.1 um, are referenced directly in most codes. Standard 55 is referenced but not specified, so we have to deal with all those. And 62.1 and 90.1 are prerequisites for lead. If you don't comply fully with the ventilation rate procedure of 62.1 and all of 90.1, uh, your project is not a lead project. Uh, compliance with standard 55 is worth up to three points, and again, showing an ADPI greater than 80% gives you one ASHRAE standard 55 thermal comfort point for lead. The ASHRAE handbook also suggests that if discharge temperatures are high because, as we all know, hot air rises, right? Uh, suggests that if the discharge temperature is high, the room will stratify and it'll be cold at the floor. Um, and 90.1 limits the quantity of air that can be reheated. And what we know is that in northern climates, cold climates, it's going to be difficult to maintain comfort with a single duct reheat system unless you have some supplementary baseboard or radiant or something else. It's just hard to do in a cold climate with a single duct box. And the answer, of course, is probably to use a fan box. So we've talked about design tools. Let's talk about loads. Uh, current loads versus what's going on in the future or what's going on in an hour. Both, we have to accommodate both short-term and long-term changes. Changes constantly happening. Conference rooms, auditoriums, you go from two people to 200. Then we got heating and cooling at the perimeter we got to deal with. The real issue though is building loads. We've been using one CFM a square foot as an interior zone load for as long as I've been in the industry. And when I started out years ago, lighting loads were six watts a square foot. Today they're 0.6 watts a square foot but we're still using one CFM a square foot as a design. And then what we're finding is the minimum ventilation rate, meeting the newest codes, may actually exceed 0.2 CFM a square foot, um, which causes us a bottom end calculation. And then a rule of thumb that sets VAV boxes at a minimum of 30% of maximum winds up, uh, a lot of spaces wind up being um, below set point every afternoon in a number of offices. And I go into offices and I see 1500 watt heaters on the floor and I say, what's that all about? And they say at two o'clock you could hang meat in here. And what's happening is systems don't have the capacity to turn down to as low a load as we have in offices today. We first started finding out about this at a research project in California. I've spoken before about research project 1515. The Yahoo campus in California, a million square foot and a couple other buildings were studied for energy consumption, occupant satisfaction, a whole bunch of factors. They studied everything. Um, they did surveys, measured energy use. They took a video camera imprint of the photo of the gas meter to measure gas usage, discovered that boilers were running in August. System was DDC, single duct, VAV reheat, reheat, and as we described, one CFM a square foot VAV boxes with 30% turned on, which was the standard eight years ago when this thing was built. Diffusers were plaque type diffusers. Well, they started looking and they discovered that it's every afternoon at two o'clock, the space hit 68 degrees, all the VAV boxes went into heating mode and controlled it to 68 degrees for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, five degree dead band in California, that's what it was supposed to do, but it's really uncomfortable at 68 at the end of the day. They did the occupant survey, they found that they had like 40% occupant satisfaction. So they reset the boxes to much lower values, 10% or 0.1 CFM a square foot. The system settled out at 0.22 CFM a square foot. Uh, that's about the minimum ventilation rate for Title 24. And occupant satisfaction went to 90%. Now the book says you can only get 80. Turns out if you aggravate everybody long enough and fix it, you can get uh, uh, higher than 80% satisfaction. And indeed, they measured over 90%. Um, and as a side incident, the boiler shut down. Think of the energy they saved. So what we learned from this was that interior loads are a lot less than one CFM a square foot, which has been the national average. 
above 80% occupant satisfaction can be achieved at very low airflows with good diffusers. Again, plaque diffusers, they were spaced properly. They did a good job on that and it proved out. And what the data showed that the interior load was close to 100% outdoor air. That means 100% of the interior loads are discharged, not returned to the air handler. This is a big deal. When the ventilation rate approaches the load, you discharge most of it because you got to maintain building pressurization. So the load in the building, most of it, is actually controlled where outdoor air is introduced, not by the stuff in the zone. This is a big deal, and this should drive a lot of decisions in what you're thinking about doing in the future. So we've talked about tools, we've talked about loads. Let's talk about diffusers. Where do I put my outlets? I've been asked this question for 45 years. Where do I put my diffusers? My favorite answer, of course, is it depends. Depends on how it looks, how well it works, and what it costs. Um, I always like to tell people, you can pick two of good, fast, and cheap. Um, this is kind of that in that same area. So we have to deal with perimeter versus interior because they have different requirements in terms of load. Perimeter zones, you get a cold convective flow falling down a window in the window. You got a high a heat load in the salt and solar load in the summer. We talked about overhead heating, never exceed 15 degrees delta T. That's different between room and discharge. And if you keep the room at 73, that means 87 degree discharge. And good luck with that. Um, but that's what it should be. And 62.1, again, code, says if the delta T exceeds 15 degrees, or if the 150 foot minute throw, that's a short throw number in everybody's catalog, doesn't make it halfway to the floor with a nine foot ceiling, the ventilation air being provided by the diffuser will go out the ceiling return and you got to bring in more ventilation air to make up for it. Now it may not be a big deal. You got to bring in like 15% more outdoor air, um, but it, you only do that when it's cold out. And if you got to bring in 15% more cold air, you got to heat it. So there's an energy penalty for not doing this. Interior zones, however, are isolated from the perimeter. Typically 15 feet is a dividing line. Um, the interior zone in Sunnyvale, California, where that Yahoo campus resided, is the interior zone there is the same as the interior zone in Saskatoon, Canada, um, where the design temperature, by the way, is minus 40. Uh, trick question, is that Fahrenheit or centigrade? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so code mandated minimum ventilation rates still have to be maintained in this interior zone. And in a lot of cases, it may actually exceed the space load. So you got to figure out how you avoid subcooling with providing cold, dry air to maintain humidity control. Uh, you can recirculate some warm plenum air if you got a fan box or a fan coil. There's strategies that can be employed to reduce this. But if you don't do anything else and all you've got is packaged rooftops, the odds are the space is going to get cold every afternoon. So open office versus closed office. Another set of parameters are different. Whereas most spaces are open office, there's always some closed offices for meetings and whatnot. Most offices today are open plan office with partitions that provide some acoustical privacy, but not a lot. And multiple diffusers are always required. And we got to look at how the jets from these diffusers collide. And this is where we can use ADPI to great advantage if you have a ceiling between eight and 10 feet and it's a suspended ceiling, not an open ceiling. So we want to see uh, something around nine foot, then we can use ADPI, which is convenient. Closed office typically only needs one diffuser. The excess air washes walls. ADPI is not meaningful in a small closed office. Turndown, however, is important. If you get a diffuser that dumps, uh, has excessive drop at low flow, um, it, it, it's almost always over somebody's desk, that's a bad thing. So you need to make sure your diffuser uh, has an operating range that's coordinated with the airflow range expected in that space. Putting a large diffuser in a small closed office almost always results in drafts under the diffuser as the cold air falls into the space. Then we got to deal with open ceiling versus closed ceiling. Not all spaces have suspended ceilings. Most catalog data assumes the airflow is along a surface. This means that it can only entrain air on one side of the jet. The top side is low pressure, it sticks to the ceiling, which keeps cold air from falling into the space, and Kawanda and Bernoulli and all that good stuff. If there's no ceiling, the reported catalog throw, unless it says otherwise, should be shortened by about 
And if you're doing a drop like shown in this example, the larger the diameter of the supply duct, the more uniform the discharge is from a short drop. That means the air has a chance to not pile up on one side. It's best to oversize the drops if you're doing this. With round diffusers, uh, we like spiral, uh, spiral diffusers on the end of a round drop, uh, round diffuser on a spiral drop because it, the air tends to go up and it avoids falling into the space. The airflow actually follows the edge of the diffuser and actually goes up slightly and works pretty well. So this is a pretty good solution. In the closed office, uh, uh, closed ceiling, the jet flows along the ceiling, uh, keeping the cold air from falling into the space. ADPI calculations is how we figure out what's happening to how the diffusers interact with one another. Um, if ceilings are greater than 10 feet, then we got to look at the throw and actually map some jets to figure out how to size the diffusers and where to put them. Question came up, grills versus diffusers. Well, we don't see grills being used a lot in an open plant office. The spacing between outlets is kind of used uh, to determine the area served. Calculating the CFM per square foot is a little more complicated. Um, again, uh, because of the grills blow air in one direction. And then the throw may be shortened by increasing the spread. Uh, you can take the blades that are uh, vertically and spread in part, shortens the throw, and you can get cold air from falling into the space. If you've got horizontal blades, adjust them slightly upward. You can keep jets from falling into the space. The rule is that 100 foot a minute throw from opposing grills should never meet or you're going to get collisions that are going to be uncomfortable. Typically, though, this is in a high space. And remember, if uh, look at the data, most grill data assumes it's along a surface. Um, with our duct mounted grills, we list both entrained and unentrained because sometimes it's near a surface and sometimes it's not. Read the fine print to know what you're doing. The perimeter is complicated. We, standard 62.1 says the 150 minute throw has got to make it halfway down the window in heating. Well, it's going to go twice as far in cooling, so you got to figure out how you're going to handle that issue. And we've got a lot of advice on that. But if you have perimeter slots, um, I like slots at a perimeter. You should locate them a couple feet from the window, blowing both ways. And here's the key. Somebody has to adjust the pattern controller in any linear slot diffuser. And the trick is getting somebody to do that. I suggest the engineer needs to make it a responsibility of the installing contractor to adjust the pattern controller. The engineer then has to give him a diagram showing him how to it's supposed to be adjusted. After all, he selected the diffuser. So uh, there are issues in perimeter zones that we need to deal with. ADPI does not work in heating. They're working on a way of making it work. It's going to be complicated because of the asymmetrical issue with diffusers being located near one wall. So it's complicated. So we kind of know about diffusers and all the different applications. Now we got to figure out what VAV box we're going to use. So really got three choices. We've got a single duct, we've got a parallel fan powered unit, and a series fan powered unit. We started out with single duct, and single ducts have been used for 50 years. With a reheat coil, you can, uh, you can do perimeters up to a point. You probably need to supplement uh, in cold climates with baseboard or radiant heating at a perimeter zone. Standard 90.1, though, says you can only bring in 30% of your cooling airflow. So uh, there is a game you can play using variable volume heating. If you control the discharge, you can start it at 20 and go up to 50. But it's tricky to do, and there is a possibility that you can't really handle the load in some climates. Standard 621 and 55 then also limit discharge temperatures to avoid stratification and to provide comfort, which seems like a good idea. Uh, when you talk to the 90.1 guys, you say, how do you meet these requirements? They say, use a fan box, such as, a parallel box. The parallel box has a fan and primary side by side. Um, the central system, primary air fan, has to shove air all the way to the diffuser so there's an increased static pressure requirement to get the air through the box, through the flex duct, to the diffuser. Um, but the fan is off when you're in cooling load, so there's an energy saving. So there's a plus and a minus. When you're in heating mode, the heat generated by the motor goes into the space. So in theory, the fan is 100% efficient no matter which motor you're using. There are some issues about leakage on dampers on parallel boxes. Uh, there's another whole long story there. You can read up on it from the Ashray Journal articles that we've written uh, on this subject. The series box, uh, the plenum air mixes with the air from the primary air damper and the fan is on the discharge. 
Uh, the fan must always deliver more air than the VAV valve supplies to prevent backflow through the big hole in the back of the box. The result, though, is much lower duct static pressures supplying a series box than a parallel box, typically an inch less pressure, which is an inch less leakage uh, and inch less energy at the central fan. And remember, there's a square function for static pressure, a cube function for static pressure at the central fan, so it's a big deal at the central fan. Um, but the fan has to run all the time in a series box, so there's a downside about the fan energy, which leads to the discussion of electrically commutated motors and a series box with an electrically commutated motor can be turned down very close to the primary, always a little more, so there's an opportunity there. If the flan, fan airflow is varied, rather than operating at constant, the energy savings with a series fan box with an electrically commutated motor can be quite significant. So primary air sensor on the VAV box has been a discussion. We get to say, what is the minimum? Well, studies on the probes everybody's probes show that they're all linear down to very low airflows. But the problem is the pressure transducer in the digital controller may not be able to figure it out. So the probe has a magnification built in. Everybody's magnification is a little different. Typically though, a signal of 0.03 has been the low end of a pneumatic controller's ability to control. So that was what we recommended for years. Today's digital controllers though are able to go much lower 0.01 is what we now recommend as a reasonable minimum, but we've seen 0.004 as a pressure signal. That's like 180 feet a minute with our probe at the bottom end. Um, uh, let the DDC guys tell you what they can do. I don't think they can go that low. That's just me. And then we get into motors. The P permanent split motor versus the electrically commutated motor. On the left, the permanent split motor is just a motor. On the right, you see the electric commutator motor and its controller, which may or may not be attached to the back end of the motor. Lately, we've been removing it from the back end of the motor because it makes airflow into the fan better. So we've looked at PSC motors. It's a constant speed capacitor start induction type motor. Some are wired for three speed, although in practice, it's really three torques. And I've seen cases where all three speeds resulted in the same amount of airflow. Um, and you put an SCR controller on it, which is a chopper, it significantly slows the motor speed but doesn't reduce the energy enough to make a difference. So it's really not a good deal. The electrically commutated motor though has a DDC controller which regulates uh, silent relays, DC relays with a DC brushless motor. Study about energy use of ECM motors and PSC motors in series and parallel. A bunch of studies were done at a couple of ASHRAE ARI research projects at Texas A&M University, finished up a couple of years ago. 25 technical papers were written discussing the opportunities and problems with series and parallel uh, ECM and PSC motors. The result was though that an ECM motor, because of the lower pressure drop on the supply system, results in lower energy use than most parallel boxes at constant volume. And if you turn it down, it's incredibly more efficient. Here's a, from the uh, research that was done, here's a shot uh, showing how ECM fan power terminals, fan power works. If I take, in this example, a 1,000 CFM fan box uh, running at full flow, you can see it's gonna draw 380 watts. But if I take a 1,600 CFM fan box and turn it down to 1,000 CFM, it only draws 185 watts. And when you turn down further, you can see they all get down to less than 100 watts when they turn down. The trick, of course, is now we've got to get back to what diffuser do we use? <laughs> uh, how much? Uh, all these questions come back, and we've got to start over again figuring out what we're going to do to get the max amount of energy savings to do it at the lowest possible airflow. So reducing the speed of a series fan box is going to use significantly less energy. The choice and facing of diffusers obviously it makes a big difference, which we showed you how to do. And if you add a sensible cooling coil to the induction port, you can even get further efficiency because you can do extended economizer operation and another other things you can save with using a sensible cooling coil on a series fan box. The Kruger Quick Reference Product Catalog provides the tools to help you figure out how to make product evaluations quick and easy. We think we've given you the tools. Diffuser spacing, turndown and ADPI are especially 
uh, useful in an open plan office. We can figure out what's going to go on. We can use ADPI to figure out which diffuser is not going to work in a closed office. We need to pay attention to the load changes in our spaces, uh, better walls, better lighting, more efficient lighting, and changes in how we work in the office with uh, people hot bunking desks and, and uh, hot desks and people working at home and figuring out all those things are going to happen. And these lead us to making proper selections on diffusers. And often the cheapest diffuser is not the one that works best. Um, and a lot of times you can use a more expensive diffuser and use less of them. And we didn't talk about it, but remember it costs $100 to put a diffuser in almost everywhere in North America. So you have to add that cost to whatever you spend on a diffuser. So think about that. And then we want to look at the VAV. Can we use a, a, a single lit box? Maybe in California and some moderate climates, but even in Houston where you might think you'd get away with it, they're using serious fan boxes everywhere in Houston. And, uh, and especially now that we're seeing the VAV fan box, that makes a lot of, makes a lot of uh, uh, sense. So the tools that we provided, the quick reference product catalog really will help you in a number of ways. For one thing, it's, it gets past all the stuff you really don't care about. The, uh, the website has a number of tools. I've written a white paper to accompany this talk, which will be posted uh, on the website. Um, as soon as we get it finally polished, it's pretty much done. It'll be available in the next day or so, um, which goes into some details on some of the technical stuff that I've thrown at you in this thing. And finally, software, we've got K-Select. Um, we've got a number of uh, spreadsheets for acoustics on the website. Um, there's even a uh, specification, acoustical specification maker program on the website. Um, so there's a number of tools that are available to help you do these things. So with that, uh, we're going to open the door for questions, and I'm going to open it back up to Lily so she can talk about the survey monkey. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, with the questions, uh, just as a reminder, just mouse over the bottom of the screen and enter your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and again, so you, you see the link here that we've posted to the quiz um, to receive your uh, certificate for uh, credit. Uh, you will be required to take that quiz and um, we will go ahead and email that link out to you uh, and you can complete it at a later time if you so choose. Um, so while we wait for questions to roll in, uh, we do have a few that have already come in. Um, and I think you may answer this one, Dan, but ADPI is used for cooling only, right? Not for heating? That's correct. <clears throat> yeah. And, and we're working on a heating ADPI, but we're not there yet. And we do have other questions here. Um, if you should not use ADPI for closed offices, what can you use to design for places like that? Well, in a closed office, the, the first thing you want to make sure of is that the diffuser is not going to dump at low flows. Uh, that's, that's the most important thing, I think, um, uh, in a closed office is to make sure the diffuser is not going to work at the low end. It, at the high end, it's going to wash the walls and, and ADPI is kind of meaningless because the, the L in the equation kind of drops out. So. Uh, I think the best thing to do is to look at what the minimum CFM per square foot would be from the ADPI charts in the big catalog. Uh, the quick reference catalog probably won't help you a lot, although it might. You can see what the minimum CFM per square foot is, but yeah, you have to do a little interpolation. Um, another question. In an open ceiling concept, if I point the diffuser towards the floor in heating mode, will all of the air get to the floor? <laughs> my, my favorite answer. It depends. The problem is, we, we've talked about this in another webinar, but as a rule of thumb, airflow is at 75 feet per minute is affected by 1% per degree delta T. So uh, when you do that analysis, you find that the air goes twice as far in cooling as it does in heating. So the problem with aiming a diffuser at the floor in heating is what do you do in cooling? This can be really drafty. And, and there's tricks to do with that, and we haven't got time to talk about it now, but understand that's what happens. There's another question asking, how do we get access to the diffuser selection program that was used here in the PowerPoint? And that one I can answer. It's going to be a link from the website. Um, I believe it's under the software tab. You'll find a K-Select, and that is our current 
uh, selection software. Yeah, it's really two programs, one for GIDs and one for boxes, but they've been around for a long time. Somebody asked, does ADPI apply to underfloor? Not yet. There's a research project uh, being proposed right now to look at uh, how we deal with underfloor. The problem with ADPI and underfloor is there's a near zone around the diffuser where it's going to be drafty and they haven't worked out exactly how to exclude that area. So it's, it's an active process, ASHRAE standard 113 as an open uh, standards method of test and they're working on that project, uh, that answer as we speak. Another question for you. Um, is it true that you get better efficiency from a higher horsepower EC motor in turndown than a smaller motor in turndown? It's tricky because when, when we talk about a, a larger horsepower motor, it's also attached to a bigger fan. And a bigger fan turned down is going to be quieter than a smaller fan running at a higher speed. So, yes, if you take if you oversize a fan powered box and turn it down, it would be much more efficient. The bad news is that you have to wire it as if it was going to run at full flow all the time. So there's a penalty in terms of fuses, wire gauge, ampacity uh, limitations. Putting an oversized box in, it'll be cheaper to run, but it might be more expensive to install. Okay, there's another question asking about uh, does ADP, ADPI work with displacement? Uh, not yet. Once again, we're trying to figure out the exclusion zone, and that's another part of ASHRAE standard 113, which is the method of test for measuring ADPI. So that's not quite there yet either. Another question. Um, is there a basic formula we can use for characterized throw based on the discharge air temperature? No. <laughs> it's complicated. There's different air patterns from the diffuser, and this is one of those eternal questions that's been asked for a long time. And the CFD guys have been trying to figure out how to make this work, and they haven't figured it out. It looks like we've answered all the questions that have come in thus far. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, thank you again for attending today's webinar. Uh, we will have a video along with the white paper posted to the website uh, this afternoon, hopefully. Um, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook as we will be posting links there as well. So with that, please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.